this idea that you cover in your book of using data visualizations to make a social impact. So not just to break conventions in the art form itself, but to try to break conventions in society. So um, you mentioned, for example, the emergence of feminist discourse in data visualization focused on highlighting and addressing inequalities related to gender, race, ethnicity, disability status, and so on. In your view, what is the responsibility of data visualizers and, and journalists in general when shedding light on these kinds of systemic biases? Well, I guess that it greatly depends on where, what you use visualization for, right? What the context of the visualization is. Obviously, if you are going to design, let's say, dashboards uh, within a company to analyze company data, perhaps these matters are not as relevant to you as they would, they would, they would be to a journalist who is trying to inform the public about uh, particular issues. It is interesting, though, that you say that because it uh, it could actually end up being the case. And I'm just uh, this is just something that popped into my head. Mm-hmm. But there actually is potentially there. There are even opportunities there yeah. where a dashboard designer in a corporate setting by just choosing to put in a co- in a toggle mm-hmm. to break down some piece of data by gender yeah. or ethnicity yeah. or maybe historically the the managers in that company aren't looking out for that. Um, or maybe you could even make the decision to be even bolder and have it be the default view um, yeah. when the person opens up the dashboard. So yeah, yeah, you know, there are issues in all types of all types of visualizations. What I was trying to perhaps convey is that yeah, yeah, yeah. there are degrees of importance. Right? To me, it's right. much more important than that uh, people who are going to put visualizations in the open to be presented to the public, that they pay much more attention to these types of matters than if you're going to design a dashboard to be consumed by 10 managers within the company. But it's still important. For example, just going going to the to the general thing, there is a specific example in the book uh, a, about a survey that asks the news organizations about the gender composition of their workforces, and they just had two options to, to report the gender of their workforce male or female, that's it, right? Men and women, that's it. Then binary, right? Why don't you have an option in the survey to for non-binary people, right? So yeah, non-binary people exist, whether you whether you believe it or not, they do exist. And therefore they need, there needs to be other options in the survey uh, that, that people can check. So that's a limitation of the data. And I point that out in the book itself. And that's something, by the way, that the designers of this survey have addressed in more recent editions of that particular survey and good for them, right? So they learn through the through the process because we need to consider not only uh, the fact that we are counting things, but also who is being counted and who is not being counted and how are they being counted, right? So yeah, these issues permeate um, uh, everything, I think, in data visualization to different degrees of importance. I cannot speak with any, with any sort of expertise on, on these matters. So I would point out a, I, I would just mention you know, some people whom I mentioned in the book, like Catherine Dignacio or Lauren Klein, who wrote a, a Data Feminism, Heather Cross, who has a website called dataassist.com, and she thinks very deeply about ethical matters related to data science statistics, but also data, data visualization. It's an area that I'm becoming growingly interested in. What types of inequities we um, we insert in our visualizations, sometimes with the best of intentions. We are just not aware of, the, of those, right? And perhaps we should be more aware of them. I thought that a particularly interesting example of this kind of social impact came up in Chapter 7, uh, talking about the work of, again, I might butcher a name here, but you can correct me, um, Federica Fregapane. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so uh, when discussing her work, you distinguish between seeing immigrants as statistical aggregates mm-hmm. versus seeing them as individuals. Individuals, yes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so how can we use data visualizations to combat dehumanization, uh, you know, just seeing people as numbers? Just show the people. <laughs> show <laughs> people. That, that's what she does in, in that visualization in particular they are, you're referring to. Uh, so this visualization is about immigration, right? And particularly, not, not just immigration, but refugees and uh, people who move from uh, war-torn countries into Europe, for example, right? So to tell that story, obviously, you can and we should show the data, right? The aggregate, the the total numbers, the sheer amount of people, whatever. But if we want to really create a well-rounded story about 
the human tragedy uh, of the uh, of, of migration through the Mediterranean. Many people die trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea from Africa to to Europe. Um, it is useful not only to show uh, the the aggregates, the total numbers, but also to show specific stories so people can connect, the reader can connect to these uh, to these migrants, and that's what she tried to do. In, these, in this project that we are referring to. Not just showing the total number of migrants, but actually focusing on the path of, I don't remember, seven or 10 migrants. And she traced those paths. So you can see you know, the, the, the incredible amount, you know, the, distant, the incredible distances that these people had to, had to travel in order to get to, to get to Europe. It's a wonderful project, I think. Yeah, this sounds like a really great way to show it. Um... It's it's wild how people practicing data scientists like our listeners, it's it's so easy to even as you're making data visualizations or building a machine learning model of the data that you're working with, it becomes so easy to be uh, detached and cold about what we're doing. And, so, and we sometimes need to do that. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's just, it's like it, it all depends on what level of aggregation we are analyzing. Mm-hmm. So sometimes we need to do that. We need to sort of like detach ourselves from the uh, from the individual people behind the data and represent those aggregates because that gives us a, 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 a different picture that if we focus on the individuals. But we should never forget about the individuals. And if we want not only to analyze the data at hand, but also to communicate the insights extracted from the data, then it is useful to communicate about the different levels of aggregation in which the data can be presented. The general statistics down to specific cases, like a a random sample, perhaps, of the individuals that are being depicted in the data and then tell their story somehow. That's how you create a well-rounded story with this combination of the general and the specific. There is an interview, by the way, with Elena Groger from ProPublica, and she talks about what in ProPublica, which is one of the gold standards, in my opinion, when it comes to data journalism, uh, what they call the far and the near. The far is the general, right? The, the, the big data set. Right? And then the near is the specific. So we need both if we want to tell a well-rounded story, particularly about uh, stories that are of human interest. It popped into my head that although we've been discussing going onto the individual level for the purposes of not dehumanizing people, it would actually also be in, say, a corporate setting, it is probably a useful way of conveying some point that you're trying to make uh, in aggregate as well. So going into kind of like a case study of, I don't know, a particular kind of user going through. Yeah, your your customers. You can create a yeah. sort of like a random sample of specific customers that have communicated with you and tell you their stories. It's like, what are the stories? What are Who are the people behind those aggregates that you're presenting? Show me some examples. Exemplify the data. Make the data a little bit more approachable, something that I can humanly connect with. So even in these types of settings, this type of approach might be useful. 